Okay, so let's get started. So uh, this lecture is called Introduction to Computation. And uh, this lecture does not give you a general overview of the field. And it does not bring you to the frontier of the field. It just gives you a, a, a basic sense of what quantum computation means. And it also serves as a really good review of quantum mechanics. So if you're not familiar with it, you can uh, focus on the, from the first part. Okay. So, uh, so here I'm having a map of modern physics. Okay, so uh, we have classical mechanics, of course. This is a Newtonian mechanics, and perhaps Lagrangian mechanics or, or, or uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, so which are pretty much identical to the Newtonian mechanics, but they are based on different assumptions, so, so they are different series. Okay, we also have electrodynamics. So um, in some time in the history, people want to unify electrodynamics and classical mechanics. So they devise something called a, a special relativity. And uh, so this is one branch of uh, physics. And also Einstein wanted to uh, 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 emerge Newtonian gravity with special relativity. So he proposed that our, our space time we're living in is a curved space and, and uh, we have something called a general relativity. And also in the other branch, we have something called quantum mechanics. So when we are moving into the uh, really, really small scale of matter, we are facing a really different set of laws. So we want to uh, 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 devise some uh, really different uh, uh, principles governing these laws. So these things are called quantum mechanics. Okay, so we, we sometimes, somehow we want to uh, merge quantum mechanics with special relativity and because when we accelerate a particle to a really, really high speed, it has really high energy, right? So this is special relativity, but um, when you have a really high energy, the particle number is not conserved, right? We have different number of particles. So we can propose another theory, it's called quantum field series. It, it, it says that, that fundamental uh, interactions and fundamental particles are actually citations of quantum field or quantized field. Okay, so and another effort nowadays is we want to uh, merge general relativity and quantum field series called a one unifying theory, as you know. And uh, uh, some candidates are uh, string theory or loop quantum gravity or things like that. Okay, so um, uh, the physics or the most fundamental physics is the high energy physics or the elementary particle physics. It basically uses um, uh, a quantum field theory and perhaps some statistical mechanics. Okay, and uh, the field we are facing in this course is called a condensed matter physics. It deals with a large number of particles and uh, when the particle number is so large, we cannot use a set of rules that is used in high energy particle physics. Okay, we have to devise a, a, a lot of new uh, toolbox uh, like uh, statistical mechanics combined with quantum field theory, combined with quantum mechanics and other lot of stuff, maybe topology, uh, maybe other things from, uh, from uh, ADSFT, from the string theory to deal with the large number of particles. And this is very different. And this is one of the most promising field nowadays in physics. And we also have biophysics. We combine biology and physics, right? We use uh, techniques from classical mechanics and statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics, maybe quantum field theory, some people say it. I don't know how, but they uh, somehow use quantum field theory in biophysics. And we also have uh, plasma physics, uh, which is uh, basically class classical mechanics, electrodynamics, uh, statistical mechanics, and perhaps something called uh, linear dynamics, which is uh, originally from uh, classical mechanics and um, it's a really promising field. And, and this is what physics is all about in these days. Uh, maybe there are some other subfields like AMO or, or, or some many, many fields, very, really interesting. So all the ideas, all the ideas we are gonna talk about is from quantum mechanics. Okay, so quantum mechanics serves, uh, uh, serves as a really uh, essential part of most of these of this series we're using today. Okay, so we want to show that how an idea, a theoretical idea from quantum mechanics can be directly turned into something that is useful and 
and we can just make calculations using quantum mechanics. It's really interesting. Okay, so let's have a brief review of quantum theory. So uh, by the end of 19th century, people found that classical mechanics, uh, namely Newtonian mechanics and classical electromagnetism contain serious inconsistencies. And from these inconsistencies, so when we are moving into a really small scale, we need a new set of theories called a quantum theory. So there's no proof for quantum theory. So we can only say that quantum theory is not in contradiction to nature. Okay, this is really important. So when we are reaching a reasonable scale, everything is not continuous, it's quantized. So what is quantized? So what is quantization? So physicists are somehow obsessed with cats, right? You have uh, heard of uh, the, the Schrodinger's cat, right? The cat can be either dead or alive. It's a superposition of dead or alive. Okay, it's pretty interesting. So uh, we have something called a Hilbert space, right? We have something called a Hilbert space. A Hilbert space consists of a lot of vectors or cat vectors. These things are called cat vectors. So um, I'm gonna introduce a linear mapping that maps the Hilbert space into a complex number. So what is this mapping? The mapping is called alpha, and we take the input of alpha as C1, psi1 plus C2, psi2. Okay, so this is a linear map. And a C1, and this linear map is defined by C1 times alpha psi1 plus C2 times alpha psi2. And psi1 and psi2 are separately a variable of this linear map for all C1 in the complex space and the psi1 in the Hilbert space, of course. And we can, you know, shorthand, we can write the alpha map uh, using a bra. And this is a shorthand. So this bra clap with this cat goes to a complex number. This is a number, okay? So generally, you have two cats, you cannot move these cats together, but if you have a number, you can move this number around, right? So the basis of Hilbert space is given by E1, E2, and this is a basis. It's just like a basis in the Euclidean space you're living in, you have an X, Y, Z, right? And these spaces are not, are not necessarily uh, uh, orthogonal, right? They can, be, uh, they can be something like this. They can be something like this in a two-dimensional space. You can, you can also span a two-dimensional space, right? But this is not orthogonal. Okay, so we can decompose psi into a psi k times ek for all psi k in C. Okay, so psi uh, is in Hilbert space. It's in Hilbert space. And so we can just decompose, just like we decompose in the Euclidean space, um, so th this one is a complex number, and uh, times a basis, right? And the basis is arbitrary. Okay. Now we uh, we are going to introduce uh, a dual basis of E k. So the dual basis is notated by uh, H star, the dual space. We call it dual space, and it's spun by the basis epsilon one, epsilon two, blah 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 blah. And this uh, complex number was a linear map. The result of the linear map of the two bases of the basis of uh, with this uh, dual basis is delta function, it's chronic delta function. And if i equals to j, it goes to uh, one, if i not equal to j, it goes to zero. And this is pretty straightforward. And okay, so, so we can just express any uh, bra or linear map in terms of all the dual basis times a complex number and sum them over. We can, all, we can also decompose this uh, linear map into this form, okay? So in this sense, we can just write alpha uh, psi here in this form, and uh, we have a sum over ij alpha i psi j times this one. This one is a delta function here, right? So we can just uh, write j in terms of i and remove the j here. This is I, this is I, okay. So as I said before, our practical way of seeing this is we can view this one as a column vector and view this one, this bra, as a row vector. 
and the row vector times the column vector gives a number, right? And in Hilbert space, this number is a complex number. Um, and this thing follows the rules of uh, matrix multi multiplication, and this is pretty uh, uh, easy way to write it down. It's called Dirac notation. Dirac invented it to uh, make the quantum mechanics uh, simpler. Right? I love this one. Okay, so uh, the basis of the Hilbert space E1, E2 uh, can be uh, and now here. Okay, so now we can introduce a one-to-one -one correspondence between these uh, two uh, Hilbert spaces. Okay, H and H star. And the psi can be decomposed into a sum over K, psi K, EK in H. And the inner product of size, maybe with phi here, phi is another state, is defined by the inner product of the bra and cats. And it yields something look like a number, right? It always look like a number. So sum over K, phi k star, this is a complex congregate times psi k. Okay, so, okay. So we also introduce the norm. The norm is sort of like the uh, lens of a vector, how big it is, right? We just use this, uh, this uh, bra and cat multiply together and take the square root. This is pretty simple. And now we construct an oxonormal basis EK, <clears throat> our normal basis is just look like this one, uh, a, a, a vector, two vectors in the two dimensional Euclidean space, which uh, has a magnitude one and uh, they are orthogonal, right? So this two can be served as our normal basis EK. So EI, EK, the inner products goes to delta IJ. So we just replace epsilon j in the previous slide with ei. So this basis is also normal. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Suppose we have a uh, psi here. Okay, we have psi here. Psi can be decomposed into this form, and we uh, and we multiply uh, ek on the left. We multiply ek here. We multiply ek here and we get this number. We can extract this number, right? And we put this thing back into the side here. We put this thing back. We have a psi times ek, psi k. And uh, we can always move this number around because it's a number we can just move to the back, okay? And we have this thing times a cat vector equals to itself, right? So we have this uh, completing relation is that we sum over all these spaces, this oxonormal basis, uh, sum over K and equal to I. The I is the identity operator H. And if H is finite dimensional, the, 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 the identity operator is a uh, unit ma matrix, right? If it's an infinite dimensional, we cannot have a matrix. So this one is I, you know, I in the uh, matrix uh, calculus. Okay, so now we come to the most important part of this lecture, it's called the axioms of canonical quantization. So what is quantization? How to quantize a system? So given the isolated classical dynamical system, so the system is dynamical, it's moving. Constructing a corresponding quantum system is called quantization. For example, you have a, a harmonic oscillator uh, in a, a, a macro scale sense, you want to quantize it, you want to uh, have a smaller version, a quantized version of the system, it's called a quantization. And um, there are five axioms that governs how to uh, canonically quantize a system. A canonical quantization is just a fundamental quantization, it's a simplest, most basic quantization. Okay, so, so, so there exists a Hilbert space H for a quantum system that the state of the system is required to be described by a vector psi in H. In this sense, psi is also called the uh, <coughs> state or state vector. 
Moreover, two states, psi and C psi, C is a complex number and C doesn't equal to zero, describe the same state. The state can also be described as a ray representation of H. So this is pretty straightforward. As I said before, you have a basis, right? You have a vector in the basis. It's just a ray representation of H. Okay. <coughs> okay, the second one. A physical quantity A in classical mechanics is replaced by a Hermitian operator A, a hat acting on H. What is a Hermitian operator? A Hermitian operator is A dagger equals to A. Okay, so if we write A in the matrix representation, I will remind you what a representation is later. So if A is a matrix, a, 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 a dagger is equal to A star, a star transpose. Okay, so in this sense, the diagonal elements in the matrix are real. And uh, off diagonal elements, for example, if on the top is x, uh, is one plus i, on the bottom is one minus i. So they are mirror symmetric, right? Because it's A star transpose. And the, the di diagonal elements are always real. So the results obtained when A is measured is one of the eigenvalues of A. And the eigenvalues are real because the harmonicity of a, a, a hat. So the operator A is often called an observable. It's uh, something you can phys physically observe, like, like position or momentum. So this is uh, uh, physical, okay? So you get uh, physical values. And the third one is the Poisson bracket in classical mechanics is replaced by the commutator. So you, 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 you always remember the Poisson brackets, right? I will now write it down here. The Poisson brackets in classical mechanics is, is replaced by the commutator multiplied by a number minus i over h, h bar. h bar is Planck constant. And so the commutator is defined by a, b, commutate, you write a, a bracket, here is equal to a b minus b a. So, so if this one does not equal to zero, so you cannot just uh, uh, measure b and then measure a, and it's different from if you measure a and then measure b. So this is uh, the fundamental difference between uh, classical and uh, quantum mechanics. So we imply the natural unit where h bar is equals to one. So <coughs> when some, sometime if we want h bar back, <coughs> we just uh, do some dimensional analysis to get h bar back. Okay, the fundamental commutation relations are q i q j is equal to p i p j commutate is equal to zero. So the position, the momentum, are uh, commutate, which uh, which are uh, uh, physical, right? So you can measure a uh, uh, position on a uh, same direction two times, and these two uh, measurements are identical, right? And if you measure a, a, a momentum and the position in a different uh, in a different sequence, it goes like this. It gives a i delta i j. So you can now exchange measurements of position and momentum. So under this replacement, the Hamiltonian equations of motion become this, okay, so we just replace the Poisson bracket in the Hamiltonian UM using these commutation relations. Okay, I can sometime, sometimes omit the hat for simplicity. <coughs> so we'll come back to this later. So when the classical quantity A is independent of T expli explicitly, A satisfies the same equation as Hamiltonian's equation. Right, so by analogy for a hat which does not depend on T explicitly, one has Heisenberg's equation of motion, which looks like this. So this is the Heisenberg EOM, and A here, A here can be a general uh, observable. It, it has to be Q or P. It doesn't need to be Q or P, it's a general uh, operator. Okay, so the four, number four, 
like psi in H be an arbitrary state. Suppose one prepares many systems, each of which is in this state. Okay, we have many, many systems. So the observation of A in these systems at time t use random results in general. So we measure a lot of times of A in the different systems, we have a random results, right? Then the expectation value of the result is given by this thing, okay? So if A is T dependent, we'll discuss it later, it's called the Heisenberg picture, and this one is a normalized constant. Okay, so number five, for any physical state psi in H, there exists an operator for which psi is one of the eigenstates. Okay, this axiom is uh, often ignored in the literature, but this, what this means? Uh, this, this axiom means that, uh, so we don't need a EI uh, basis for an operator. For any general state psi, we can always have its own operator that makes psi an eigenstate of this op operator. So I can say it's equal to some a psi is equal to number a psi. Okay. Okay, I recommend this book. So it has a really good review of quantum mechanics and uh, some other uh, really advanced topics about geometry, topology, things like that, and mathematics. <clears throat> okay. So uh, let us take a closer look at number four. So let's assume the norm of psi is one, so it's normalized. So this one is one, this one is one. Okay, so uh, ATN is equal to AN, -N, so N is an eigenstate of the operator A hat T. So N is normalized, right? And then psi can be decomposed into psi N times the N cat, right? it can always be decomposed into all the bases. And psi n is equal to, if you want to express psi n, we just multiply uh, n bra here. And the psi a hat t psi, we can just omit one here, this is one, right? And can be written in this form. It's psi m star psi n, m a t n, sum over m and n. And this n here, this n here, is summed over some number a, which is equal to the probability of b of psi being in n uh, square root. Okay, so this thing is called a uh, uh, square. I mean. So this thing is called the probability amplitude square. So something inside here, psi n square is called the probability amplitude. Okay, this thing is complex. This thing is complex. But the probability should be real, right? So the probability cannot be complex. There's no such thing like a, a, a complex probability. So this thing here, this thing here, is a real number, it's physical, right? So this thing is just the expectation value. Okay, we just sum over all, all the possibilities of being in each state okay so this one here goes to n n right and n can be moved to the front and m n is equal to delta m n right so we can have this a n right here and sum over n okay so for a hat with continuous spectrum the spectrum is a set of eigenvalues right if the set of eigenvalues is continuous, A, right here, so psi is equal to integrate over dA, psi A, psi of A times the A cat. Okay, it's integration rather than summation. And the completeness relationship is given by the sum, uh, the, the integral over dA, bra, uh, cat, uh, bra, uh, cat A times bra A, and this is, uh, uh, identity uh, operator. So we can have this relation right here. So integral over d a prime, a prime, a prime. So we just multiply this i on the left. a is equal to a itself, right? So this one here is identity operator here. 
<coughs> and we can always extract this one, this one, as a direct delta function. You should know direct delta function. I'm not gonna explain what direct delta function is. Okay, so psi a, psi a here is defined by this one, uh, a bra a times a cat psi, and if we replace this a with x, this is a psi x you're familiar with in the Schrodinger equation, right? So just uh, so connect all this direct bracket notation to the Schrodinger equation you learn in your undergraduate physics course. Okay, so we have this one here, right? We can always have this thing is always equal to one. This is a normalization condition. And we can have this thing, so sum over all the probability of psi being in each A, which is summing over using integration is equal to one. So all the probability, uh, all, the, all the possibility of being in each state sum over should be one, right? Should be a hundred percent. Okay, so let's recall the expectation value is given by this one, right? It's given by uh, some, uh, no, not some over, it's uh, uh, integration over dA, a times psi a square. So the probability which, which the measured value of a is found in the interval between a and a plus dA is psi a squared times dA. So we can define psi a squared or a psi squared as rho a is called the probability density. Okay, it's called the probability density. This is a probability density you are you're familiar with in your uh, Schrodinger equation you learn from your uh, undergraduate physics course. Okay, so um, let's talk something uh, really interesting and important. It's called a unitary transformation. And this transformation is really essential in the quantum computing. So there are two important types of operators. One is called a Hermitian operator. And the Hermitian operator, as we discussed before, is uh, ob observable, it's something physical, right? And a unitary transformation is a symmetry transformation and that preserves some physical quantity, like translation. So um, like if I have a, I thought, have a cup, or, or we can translate the cup and the cup is the same cup, right? Or we can also have a rotation or time evolution, so evolution and uh, change of basis. So we can always construct a unitary transformation in some sense, in some way. Okay, so we have theorem here. So given two eigenbases, AK and BK, these two eigenbases of two operators, A and B, and A and B do not commute to each other, and there exists a U such that BK is equal to UAK. So we change the basis using a unitary operator u, and k is equal to one to n. Okay, with u dagger u is e equals to uh, equals to u u dagger equals to i. This is this is a fundamental relation of unitary operator. This is really essential. Okay, so a proof. So let's try u equals to this one. The u is defined as sum over k b k cat a k. So we can always check that if you apply u on al, it goes to bl. So you apply u here, you replace this one to l, so it goes to bl. It's pretty straightforward, right? And you can also check u dagger u is equal to u u dagger. You can sum over k and l of the u's. So we have al, bl, bk, ak is equal to uh, the identity operator. QED. Okay. <coughs> okay. So let's continue. So we have the Heisenberg equation of motion, right? Before we have this Heisenberg EOM, looks like this. So if you write A and H explicitly, AH minus HA, we can we can solve it, right? We can solve it. And the, and the, and the solution is a t is equal to e i h t a zero e minus i h t. This is the solution. So a here is time dependent. 
right? So A0 in this sense is related to AT by a unitary transformation, right? So U, U dagger A, U, uh, yeah, U, U, U dagger A0, U is equal to, uh, is equal to AT, right? So we can write the expectation value of AT in this form, it's very straightforward. We just place the AT right here, and we can just write it down like AT. A is T dependent. This is called the Heisenberg picture, where operator are time dependent. And we can also separate this thing and this thing with a zero, and we have a time dependent, we have a time dependent cats and brass, or time dependent states, right? And a zero here is time independent. So this is called the Schrodinger picture, just let you know. Okay, so one remark is that we can always devise any Hamiltonian to apply any unitary transformation. So this is really important in quantum computation um, in, in the sense that we, we can uh, always devise any physical system to uh, process our qubits, which is kind of what a qubit is later. So to uh, uh, manipulate the qubits, <coughs> by using uh, unitary transformation, which is a time evolution, right? We can always devise a Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian represents a physical system, which is kind of like a quantum circuit, right? So we can always devise any quantum circuit, any quantum circuit to perform any pro uh, calculations, computations we want. Okay, this is all about unitary transformation. Okay, now let's get to our quantum computation. So uh, before getting into quantum computation, let me talk a little bit more about classical computation. So what we are using in our uh, computers, your Macs, your service stations. So the idea of a classical computer is really, really genius. So why is that? So <clears throat> we are trying to use some machine to uh, perform the logic operations. You know, from the mathematics point of view, we can always construct uh, everything from uh, the simplest logic, like n or nand, or this is, this is called a propositional logic. And using this logic, you can construct something called a set theory, or, 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 or uh, Franco Zamello set theory, or axiomatic set theory. And from the set theory, you can just construct everything you want, like topology, like like a uh, uh, differential geometry, like uh, uh, other sort of stuff. Everything is logic. So you, we want a machine that can, that can manip manipulate this logic, right? So we have a classical computer, which uh, takes zero and one, which is a binary, right? And gives a result. How we can manipulate this results and using, uh, using uh, uh, transistors or field effect transistors, we build a physical circuit using these transistors and put a threshold here when the when the uh, current or, or voltage is uh, higher than the threshold it goes to one and lower than the threshold it goes to zero and in this sense we create a, a two bit right well, uh, a zero and one bit and we manipulate these bits to uh, uh, do math basically and the quantum computer is a more genius. Why is more genius? So Feynman proposed that Richard Feynman is a really great man, and uh, he proposed that. Uh, so the quantum mechanics is closer to the physical world or the reality we are living in, right? So the goal of a computer is to simulate the world around us. And why don't we use something is closer to the world to simulate the world? So why don't we use something uh, quantized or quantum mechanics to simulate the world or do computations? So why not? So this is the basic idea of quantum computation. So let's get started with a very simple example. It's called quantum teleportation. This is uh, just an example. Okay, <clears throat> so now we have a problem. Well, the problem is we have a girl, Alice. Alice wants to deliver a qubit psi to Bob. Okay, Alice doesn't know the qubit. Uh, she doesn't know, she didn't matter the qubit. And she can only use classical channels. So in this sense, Alice wants to communicate uh, a quantum, a, qu a qubit side, a quantum thing to Bob using classical channels. How to, how, how to do that? So what is a qubit? 
So there are some basic kind of definition. A qubit is a two-state quantum system, which is a superposition of zero and one state, okay, that carries information. So what can be a, a, a qubit or a two-state quantum, uh, quantum system? Any two-state quantum system can be a qubit, right? So for example, we have spin. We have spin up, spin down. These are the two degrees of freedoms of a spin, right? And this is SU2. If you if you know some group theory, and you can also have a photon, right? Photon has two polarizations. So I have a question: Why why photon has two polarizations? It's, it's moving in a three dimensional space. So the reason is uh, a photon is moving in the speed of light, and it freezes one DOF. Okay. So we can have a lot of two systems. Well, Schrodinger's cat is a two system, two state system, right? Yeah, a cat can be uh, either alive or dead in the box. It's a two state system. <coughs> and also, what is quantum teleportation? A quantum teleportation is a technique for moving quantum states around. Okay, even in the absence of quantum communication channel, so we're only using classical channels like telephones. We don't use quantum communication channels like uh, some fiber that can communicate qubit. <coughs> so a quantum entanglement is that each particle of pair or group cannot be described independently of the state of the others. Okay, if you want to do something to one particle of the system, you have to do something to other particle of the system, even if the particles are separated by a large distance. So even if the particles are separated apart, if you do something to one particle, the second part will be affected. So this is quantum entanglement. And this is really, really interesting. Okay, <clears throat> so um, we have our toolbox. So the toolbox is a quantum gate, right? We only need to use two quantum gates, or maybe some more quantum gates um, we'll discuss later. But for now, we are focused on these two quantum gates. It's called c not gate and Hadamard gate. So the c not gate just uh, takes two qubit values, uh, take x as an input, and uh, manipulate the second qubit y. And this addition sign here is uh, called uh, bitwise addition modulus two. So one plus one modulus two is equal to zero, right? It's bitwise uh, addition. <clears throat> and uh, C can be represented using a matrix. The reason why I use this equal sign, equal sign with a dot on it is because this representation is unique. And it's not unique. It is dependent on which basics, which basis you are choosing, right? <clears throat> so C naught uh, operates uh, two qubit states, so it's a four-dimensional matrix. Okay, we also have a Hadamard state, a Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate uh, gives uh, 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 that just separates a single quantum state into two of them, in two. Uh, into a superposition of of quantum states, and is represented by this matrix, which also can be uh, 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 expressed in, in in the form of poly matrices. So these are poly matrices. If you have encountered spins in your uh, uh, quantum mechanics course, you should know poly matrices. And H is Hermitian, right? It's easy to prove. And H square is equal to I. This is some uh, property of the Hartman gate. It's just an operator operating on one state. Okay, so let me introduce another rule. It's called the generous Born rule. You may heard of it, the Born rule. So a uh, n plus one qubit system psi is equal to alpha zero times a phi plus n plus beta one times phi minus n. So this, this this is normalized, right? The alpha square plus beta square is equal to one, and uh, the phi here are generalized normalized state for n qubits. So psi is n plus one qubit, right? Psi uh, phi plus minus is a n qubit. So for n equals to two, a psi uh, a phi plus a phi phi minus two can be a superposition of all possible states uh, that can be generated using two qubits. And each 
associated with a number, a complex number. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this thing sum over, square sum over is equal to one, which means that all the possibilities of measuring these states is 100%. Okay, sum over all the possibilities. So if we measure only the first qubit, for example, this one, we can get the probability of measuring zero is equal to alpha square, right? So if we measure it, the state claps into one, either one of its eigenstates, and we only have the probability. The state after measurement is this one, it claps into this one. So before the measurement, everything is just a probability of alpha and beta, right? Alpha square and beta square. So this one is uh, something called a generalized Born rule. Okay. <coughs> So uh, Alice has two qubits, A and C. So um, psi C is equal to alpha zero C plus beta one C. And Alice wants to uh, deliver this state, deliver this state to Bob. <clears throat> okay, so we have step zero, Alice goes to Bob. They, uh, they uh, go together and they, they uh, create an entanglement together. So Alice has a qubit A is maximally entangled with Bob's qubit B. So this thing is called ERP, ERP pair. So this one is a maximally entangled state. So you can never separate zero and one using some psi one cat times psi two cat. You can never separate the state in this way. It's a maximally entangled. So if if you change zero or if you change A, you have to change B. So because these two are really, really interconnected. So we have this uh, phi plus AB. And the three qubit state, psi C, direct product with psi plus AB is equal to uh, this one. You just multiply all these things alpha zero beta one and with zero zero one one and you get this result okay so step one alice applies a c not gate on her two qubits a and c so we have this state right here right and we apply a c not gate a c not is a takes a control bit and moves some target bit okay so uh you just change zero zero to zero zero and zero one to zero one because it's a bitwise addition and one zero to one one and zero a uh, plus one right and one one to one zero because one plus one modulus two is equals to zero right and we just take the signal here and the state goes to this right we just flip flip c here right the c one c and one plus one a this goes to zero right uh, otherwise the things doesn't change they are identical right okay step two alice applies hardman gate on qbc so we have the previous state here right here so apply a hardman state a uh, hardware gate on a uh, uh, QBC. And so we just, what do we do? We just separate one and zero into a one plus zero and one minus zero, right? So we just rewrite zero here in terms of alpha times zero plus one, beta times zero minus one. And we just separate everything from here using uh we just uh separate c a and b and recombine b together we get this four superposition of the original bit right the original qubit qubits system right three qubits and we have these four things these are really really important so what does this mean so step three alice measures uh, qubit C and A. So Alice measures this part. 
remember that now Alice and Bob are really, really far apart, but Alice can always measure her own states C and A, right? So if, if Alice measures C A equals zero, zero, and she knows that the state associated with Bob is just alpha zero plus beta one, right? This is actually the original state Alice has. It's the original size C. It's the original size C. So she can just give a Bob a telephone call and tell Bob, you can do nothing. You just uh, extract your state alpha and beta here, right? And case two, if uh, Alice measures C, a equals to zero one, zero one here, and Bob has a alpha one plus beta zero, and now we want to flip alpha and beta, right? We want to exchange these two things. So if Alice measures zero one, she can make a phone call to Bob and tell Bob you can apply something called X gate. Now X gate just flips alpha and beta, and we give Bob uh, the size C here. Right, this is size C. This is size C. That's the same. Okay, if we have in case three, if, if Alice measures one and zero, if Alice measures one and zero, what do we have here? We have alpha zero minus beta one, right? We want, we want the flip sign of beta, right? So Alice can make a phone call to Bob, say, you can just apply a Z gate, and Z gate just flips the sign of beta, and we give alpha plus beta, right? In case four, if Alice measures one, one, and Bob gets this one, right? Bob gets this one, and Alice make a phone call, and Bob applies both X and Z, and what we have here is alpha one plus beta zero, which is the original state we want to get. So this is quantum teleportation, so this is, and this gives you a sense how we can manipulate all these qubits, all these qubits, uh, 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 and get the results we want. And the next example we are going to talk uh, talk about the uh, quantum computation, which is uh, much more interesting than this example. Okay. <laughs>